this song, asking Thank him to fill this atmosphere. Yeah. Thank you. Asking him to overcome this place, overcome your home with his presence. He is so awesome. When you welcome him, that's what he does. He overcomes your atmosphere. It's a blessing when we can get to do that. You know, there's people in different parts of the world, they don't have that freedom. They don't have that privilege to welcome his presence like we do. So we're so blessed. And we're so blessed that you were able to join us tonight. And before I start, that song really spoke to my heart. And uh, I really want to share what we're doing this weekend. On Saturday, we're going to be walking for life. We've been excited that we had this opportunity, this blessing to be able to walk for life. Yes. And um, this Saturday, there's going to be thousands of people out there walking for life. We had had a goal to raise $300,000, and we have raised, praise God, 81%. We have raised so far $244,400. We were at the halfway mark, and now we're at the three-quarter mark. So if you have not given, please don't miss out on this blessing. Don't miss out on this opportunity where you can bless a ministry like Choices, a ministry where they not only save babies, but they save lives. Today I had the opportunity and the blessing to be in his presence when I had a young girl sitting in front of me who came in from a very dark place, came and wanted um, not to save that life. She opened up and she poured her heart out to me and I was able to listen to her, to have compassion, not to judge her, to love on her, to give her tissue to cry. Praise God that after our prayer, the test results came out negative and she came out, out, out of that room Jesus in her heart. Amen. Awesome. So Praise she the Lord. is having her life saved. So we're not only saving babies, we're saving lives. We're empowering women. We're encouraging women to have hope. And before she walked out the door, she asked me, are you on WhatsApp? And for us older generation, we need to be on WhatsApp because the young people, that's what they use to save money when they can't pay for right. phone bills. So. Yes, I'm on, on WhatsApp, so I told her, yes, I'm on WhatsApp, so, you know, exchanged numbers, and she texted me today on WhatsApp, and said, hey, this is my number, and so we get to continue to minister, right. and to be part of their lives, and she came here to a, a place in a dark time in her life, she has no family, no parents, the only person that was living with her passed away, 20 years old, and just desperate and lonely and scared. Mm -hmm. And she left choices, encouraged and empowered, knowing that she has another chance in life, another chance that she can live for Jesus now. And so that's a blessing. This is the type of things that we do. We do not only give out free ultrasounds and free pregnancy tests. Um, we, we also empower women. We give them hope You know, when they come in feeling hopeless. We're a beacon of light to a lot of people in this world, you know, not only to women, but to men. I have shared my testimony with men who came in with their wives, wanted to have an abortion, and they chose life. So um, I really encourage you to be part of that. In Orlando, we are the third largest abortion um, vulnerable state, and a lot of people come to Orlando to have abortions. You know why? Because we do abortions in the state up to six months. So that is, um, that's a situation where uh, we really need the Lord's hand, yeah. you know. And uh, this, from this part of the year, we've already had 66 confessions of faith this year. Yeah. Yeah. So Thanks people Lord. are being saved, and uh, people are getting to know who Jesus, Jesus is. You are the church body. It's not <coughs> just us here coming to Fusion Church. We as believers, we are the church. So you may be thinking, well, you know, that's something that the church has to do. It's not just the church physically, but it's the body of church. It's not just a building, it's us believers. Amen. Amen. We are responsible to be part of things like this because life is important to God and life should be important to us. 
So I pray that you will join in faith with us, that you will partner with us. You just go online, go on Facebook. We have a page. You can give. Um, it's tax deductible. And if you can join us on the walk this Saturday, it will be at Blue Jacket Park in Orlando. And registration is at 8.30, and we start the walk at 9 o'clock. So that would be a blessing. Amen. So um, we'd love to start um, by asking you if you have any prayers. We'd love to pray for you. Um, text us your prayer request at 407-490-4019. Again, the number is 407-490-4019. And we are going to declare Psalm 91. There's power in the word of Jesus. And we're truly more gathered in his name. He is in the midst of us. So let's declare this with boldness. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say to the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him I will trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of power and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be a shield and muffler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor the destruction of the waste of the day. A thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you, to keep you in all your ways. And in their hands he shall bear you up, that you dash your foot against a stone. He shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample on foot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high. Because he has known my name, he shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble, I will deliver him and honor him. With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Amen. Let's welcome Pastor Street, who is going to bless us with this Bible study. May you be blessed. Thank you. We serve an awesome God. Amen. Amen. He looks at the, at the desires of our hearts and he tries to put those things in our heart that would mean and resonate with his kingdom. You know, oftentimes we uh, become passionate about certain things not knowing the fact that it is something God has put in our heart. You know, his truth, his way of doing things, his, his uh, will and his plan is always... Um, written over our heart and out of the abundance of heart mouth speaks so may the Lord have his way in our lives and we will continue to stand for the righteousness so we may stand with life stand with God all for his glory Amen, Amen. Um, well today is a Bible study day so I have to uh, I'm planning to start a new Bible study I believe God is uh, leading me in this direction so, so I can uh, um, share some things. Um, so go with me to the book of Matthew, 20th chapter. This is just like an introduction. I just want you to uh, uh, keep your mind uh, set there. So as we go into the study, we will have more of an understanding of where we are going. To the book of Matthew, 20th chapter, starting at verse 20. Matthew 20, starting from verse 20. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him. And he said to her, What do you wish? She said to him, Grant that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right hand and the other on the left, in your kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They said to him, We are able. So he said to them, You will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared by my Father. 
And when the ten heard it, they were greatly displeased with the two brothers. But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Amen. 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 Before we study this, I want to um, talk a few things about what's the, what we are going to be studying. Um, what God has laid on my heart is to study on the letters, one of the letters John writes, which is 1 John, the 1 John letter. I want to study that, but I want, before I study something, I always like to study the, the uh, premise of the story as well as the premise of the author. That gives a good perspective about whatever we are studying. You know, whenever, you know, when, when I am speaking, I could say something that would mean entirely different from when you are using the same word. Mm -hmm. Because of the culture I was brought up in, uh, the surroundings I was, uh, I was around, or whatever it may be. It has a different influence, but when it is coming from me, that has a different connotation versus when you say it, mm -hmm. when any other person might say it. But the origins, when we study the origins, it, uh, it, it always uh, explains many things for us. I sincerely urge you, anytime you're doing Bible study, don't just study the text. Always try to find out who is writing it, to whom it is being written, and if that person is writing, what is that person's nature? If he is writing to someone, what is the culture and the need of that hour? We have to look at all those questions. If we don't, we miss out on the big picture. Our uh, um, understanding, you know, remember, uh, you cannot understand something that you cannot imagine. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you have to imagine, firstly. You know, God himself, when he creates anything, he imagines. Everything is in imagination. That's why God always wants you to imagine. You know, I like the, the uh, motto of uh, uh, Disney, where he says, Walt Disney, imagine. Mm -hmm. He's always about imagination. Mm -hmm. And look what he, he, what, uh, uh, he got accomplished. Mm -hmm. Just with a sheer imagination. Yeah. You know, everybody thought he was crazy. Like, nobody will say that now. <laughs> you know, if you don't want to go to uh, Disney, then you will be called crazy. These days, that's how uh, it is, though I don't go to Disney. But anyway, uh, um, it's all in the imagination. God's creation is imagination. And I sincerely encourage you, uh, imagination, when you can't have an imagination that you are healed, you will never be healed. Mm -hmm. Amen. You first have to have that image. <clears throat> you know, why would God... Create man in his own image. Think of that for a moment. The best there is, is here. And he is imagining this man to be just like him. So in through that, he was able to create him. He was able to uh, breathe life into him. So uh, it takes a, 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 a lot of the times we have the saying, it takes a lot. But let me tell you something. It takes an imagination. <clears throat> Everything has to start with an imagination. If you don't imagine, you cannot believe. And when you don't believe, you will not have it, right? Yeah. Okay? So, um, the same way when we are doing any Bible study, we want to find out all these things that would allow us to have a better imagination. And in through that, we, were, we, are, we will be able to understand it better. That is why I'm making an attempt of introduction before we even start the study. Now, what I am trying to go after, First John, the letter First John is written, most of the people agree with this thing, historians have uh, facts to back this thing, 
that it is written by one of the one of Jesus' disciples, the twelve disciples, John. Um, who is also part of his uh, close core group, right? You know, mm -hmm. there are 12 people, 12 disciples that Jesus had, and out of those 12, there are three. Again, John, James, and Peter. Mm -hmm. These were the closest to him. And again, another thing also, there is, I believe, uh, uh, there is a relationship between, uh, uh, between Jesus and the, and the Zebedees. There is a relationship for them also. Uh, 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 I, can, I can prove it whichever way. Uh, but, um, so there is more uh, uh, on this line. And again, when Jesus uh, called them into the ministry, they were fishing. So they have some, uh, some, uh, some characters with them that, that helps us understand people's personality. You know, no matter what you become, your personality doesn't change, you know. You know, you, you, if you are an aggressive person, even when you are born again, you will become aggressive still. Mm -hmm. But your direction changes, that's all. That's what being born again is. Your passion will have a different direction. And that's what God wants us to be. We will, he has put those natures in us so we may use it in the wrong direction. Oftentimes if you see the people that are uh, doing bad things in their life, it's only because their, their, their passion is wrong, not wrong, their nature is not wrong, but it is that they are putting it in the wrong direction, that's all. It's just the direction. If we change the direction, everything else works. You know, that was the biggest conviction that the Lord has given me when I first came to the Lord. I started becoming so mellow. When I came to the Lord, I'm like, okay, just let me be very, uh, this is protocol, this is what is called as uh, humility, so I should be talking mellow, I should be being so uh, quiet and so uh, appealing and all those kinds of things. <clears throat> and then God one day had to rebuke me. And uh, the rebuke was that I have called you, I have given you that passion. I need you to use it in my direction. Yeah. So I was, uh, when I was uh, a sinner, I was passionate to go get into a fight. The same passion, I can use it in saving somebody. Yeah, amen. 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 Yeah. And that has become the life model for me. Why can't I do that? If, if uh, uh, I have gone through so many things so I can hurt somebody, why can't I do the same thing to save somebody? Yeah. You know, again, I used to hold grudges a lot. You know, if I can hold grudges a lot, why can't I hold faith? Yeah. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen? There's nothing wrong holding is our character. But what we are holding, which direction, that, that's how we are defined. There's nothing wrong with what we have. All we, the problem is about the direction. That's why when Jesus first started preaching, what did he preach? Repent. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Yeah. That was the first thing he preaches, isn't it? Mm -hmm. What is repent? Change of direction. Mm -hmm. Amen. He just wants you to change the direction. You're going this way. Just turn this way. Use the same passion. Use the same character. Use the same resources. You know, you, you have to use money to fund your addictions, right? Or your issues, whatever it may be. You have to use them. the same money you use it to fund the kingdom. Amen. So there is no, no difference with our passions. But the only thing is the direction. <clears throat> So what I'm trying to uh, depict also here is this person's passions and this person's uh, uh, understanding and such things that would allow us to understand where he is coming from. Now, uh, whether we acknowledge it or not, um, a lot of our uh, 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 expressions or our uh, uh, words or things are part of our culture. The culture we grew up with. Amen? Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Some cultures have certain things and some cultures have certain influences. It's just the culture. It doesn't have to do with anything else, you know. Mm -hmm. The culture influences. Whatever the culture that we are brought up around, we tend to be like them. Mm -hmm. And that's why we always, human beings, we are more like a, uh, a, 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 what, 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 tribal people. We just want to find the like-minded people and stick there. Or we want to just find that comfort zone, what we can call as comfort zone, we just want to sit there. Mm -hmm. But in all reality, this is just a, a side note, in all reality, if you are not challenged out of your comfort zone, you are not growing. Right. You have to challenge yourself to come out of your comfort zone. You have to challenge. I never imagined myself standing in front of the people and pre speaking. Believe it or not. Now you might be saying, yeah, I can't stop you. <laughs> right? But there was a time I used to call my mom from outside. If any relatives have come to my house, I would call her and ask her, Mom, did they leave? So I can come back home. I didn't even want to talk with them. Uh, and now God calls me to be a pastor. I'm like, Lord, you got to be. I don't know what I can say for that. <clears throat> you know, I just want to be by myself and do my things. You know, sometimes if nobody is in the house, every light is turned off. I just sit in a corner. I'm probably watching my phone or checking things or even just staring into the darkness. That's it. I really don't need company. I am my own company. That's my nature. That helps me with my Bible studies. I can, I use that, you know. You can have 1,001 people all around me. I can still focus on my Bible study. I don't really need anybody and everybody gone. I can study mine. You know, sometimes I'd be tending to my daughter and I still do my Bible study. It doesn't bother me much. Um, but that, that, same, that same person, God is like, okay, I have created you for this. But I thought I didn't have it in me, but I had it in me. But I used it more for going for a fight. I didn't mind fighting unknown people. I had problems talking to unknown people, but I didn't have any problem fighting unknown people. I, I think you get my point. <laughs> um, so um, this person, what I would also, this is the same person that we are going to be studying a letter written by this person. I just want to study a little bit on this person before we go to what he is writing. Or at the same time, I would like to study a little bit on to whom he is writing. It also makes a big deal. Mm -hmm. Big deal. When we don't understand, we just, just paint everyone with the same brush. That's pretty wrong. We always try to do that, especially with the Bible study. Oh, Bible is Bible. No, no, no. There is a lot of diversity in the Bible. <clears throat> if we can understand the diversity of it, we will also appreciate the unity of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. When we can acknowledge diversity, we appreciate unity. There is the, 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 that's a fundamental truth there. Because when we can't appreciate diversity, we can never adapt to unity. Because if, if I am trying to make my wife look just like me, or do and act just like me, there is no reason for unity. Mm -hmm. Because you and me are the same. But when we embrace the diversity of each other, what we are doing, we are creating a unit. What you got, I don't have. What I have, you don't have. Let's come together. What we do these days call it as corporations. <clears throat> we bring everybody under the same big umbrella and try to make it work. So that's what the, the diversity and the unity of it. But anyway, um, going here, then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with her sons kneeling down and asking something from, from him. And he said to her, what do you wish? So look at, look at this thing. Uh, um, everybody came to Jesus asking for something. The blind body man came to be healed. But this is probably a peculiar place where Jesus asked, what do you wish? 
Because they know their needs are all met. They didn't have, they don't really need much. They, he knows that because they both live with him. He's paying them, right? So now the mother is coming there and he is asking her, what do you wish? And uh, she said, grant that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right hand and the other on the left in your kingdom. And Jesus answered and said, you do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the, um, the cup that I am about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? No, the answer is, they said to him, not her. Okay, the request came from the mother, but the sons are answering this thing. They said to him, we are able. Maybe I might put a question mark, mom knows the best, right? That's a common notion. Don't hate me, mothers. I'm just putting it out there. Everybody puts that, oh, mom knows the best, mom knows the best. The mom here, does she know the best? No. Think about that for a moment. I'm not here to conclude, but think about it for a moment. But what I'm trying, what, what is this here is, Okay, you need to understand family structure. You know, oftentimes people that couldn't get to me, they would go to my mother. All my mother has to do is tell me. She won't even ask me. She would tell me, you're sleeping in so-and-so's house. I'm like, when did I sign up for this? <laughs> They're not going to be in the house, so you will be their housekeeper, huh? Okay. Well, I didn't even know this, but they went to my mother. My mother promised them and them. <laughs> I don't even have a say in this thing. The next thing I know, I'm sleeping there. <laughs> in a similar way, here, what I, what I have proposed before, I believe the Zebedees are relatives to Jesus. There is a good possibility the mother of uh, uh, John and James and mother of Jesus are sisters. So now what is happening here? These two are pulling on ticket here. Let me send, my, send, send the, uh, the aunt here. <laughs> so the aunt is coming now. Hey, look, Jesus. <laughs> okay, I, I have a wonderful aunt, you know, you know, if she comes and says certain things, I'm like, okay, I got to do this now, <laughs> right? Uh, because, because there is, there is a, a, a link like that here that uh, um, this mother, the, the, the aunt is coming to Jesus and like, okay, I need this faith. And that's why he asks, uh, what do you wish? It almost sounds like Godfather to me. <laughs> I don't know if you see that or not. I can see it. Jesus sitting there and the mother comes here asking, oh, okay, what do you wish? <laughs> can you imagine that? Mm -hmm. Is it only me? <laughs> um, but uh, when, when after they propose that request, Jesus says, okay, there is a price to pay. It's not going to be just something given to you just like that. There is a price to pay. Are you able to drink from the cup I drink? They didn't get it. They don't understand what he is saying. They didn't get all the uh, 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 things of it. You know very well, Jesus himself says, take this cup away from me. Yeah. Jesus himself couldn't bear that. And that is what they are desiring. Hmm. Okay, we talk about John Peter uh, as someone who stepped put ahead, right? He, he's the one guy who's like, oh, what about me, God? Can I walk on the water too? That's him. That's Peter. Now, we don't think of John and James, John and James are like that. But they are too. Okay, now look at this thing, this picture. There are these 12. Then, there are these three. In these three, two of them are brothers. So now let me kick the third guy out of the scene, which is Peter. Okay? So let me have the right side and the left side, so Peter will be kicked out. 
That is what they are asking. Yeah. A place <laughs> at the table. So they can eliminate it. You know we are family, right? <laughs> <laughs> For what all we know, the region they live, they probably are all family. They are all related, related to one another. But um, uh, they say, like, don't do business with family, right? <laughs> you you got to see what Jesus had to go through. <laughs> um, they, uh, he, they, they ask, and you see the nature of them. They are passionate people. John and James, they have a goal. They were wanting to go to the end by any means. Whatever possible avenue they might find, they want to use that as their chip. Mm. In this case, they're using their mom. In all reality, they're asking for a noble thing. In a way. To be by the side of Jesus? Yeah. If somebody is offering that, we probably be trampling all over. But they are looking for that opportunity. They are looking for, for that place, that position. They want to be close to him. Remember, the same John never identifies himself as John in the book of John. The gospel according to St. John. He never identifies himself as John. He always identifies himself as the one whom he loved the most. Are you with me here? See, this is something insight into John's character. He wanted to be so close to Jesus. Remember, even when the Bible, when he depicts about it, so he laid on the one whom he loved, his bosom. See, he wanted that intimacy with Jesus. He wanted to live with him. He wanted to go wherever he goes. He's the first one, last one to leave Jesus when the cross has happened, right? He was there with him throughout. Mm -hmm. And even the Bible says he ran naked. He was there for the longest of all the twelve. And he's the first one to run to the tomb. So in all through these things, I would like for us to imagine his character. As much as we like to depict Peter as the promising guy. Now, now, the same Peter, I want you to remember this story, if you get a chance, read it. Uh, where uh, after Jesus was resurrected, he asked, uh, Peter asked Jesus, what about him? What about John? He asked him. <clears throat> he might live forever, what does it concern to you, is what Jesus has to answer Peter. That means there is that, that, that competition for between both of them to be closer to Jesus. Even though they are in a circle, they still wanted to be like one with Jesus. So uh, uh, that is probably the most, uh, 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 what I can say is most possible reason why uh, John is okay with being thrown into boiling oil. Right? The book of Revelation, when he was writing the boy, the book of Revelation, he was thrown into hot oil. Mm. And some of the historians depict uh, the, 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 the Patmos, whenever you get, I think I, I was able to uh, watch that uh, documentary about that uh, uh, island, Patmos Island. Uh, in there, in, in the rocks, there are some indentations right there, like this. So the way you see it is like if you, if you are kneeling down and praying, you will leave those marks. And remember, he is making those marks in the rocks. That means he prayed there every single day. You know, in the Patmos, that's, that's, that's where he received the book of Revelation from the Lord. The book of Revelation, that's an amazing thing. Because in all, in all reality, that gives us hope of tomorrow, amen? The book of Revelation, that's why the Bible says, blessed is he who reads it. Yeah. Just reading it alone will make you blessed. Mm -hmm. So here, um, uh, the, 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 the character of John is that he wants to be intimate with Jesus. 
He wants to be one with Jesus. The way he found out is it's through love. I can't do this thing by pulling a, a relationship. I can't do this thing by doing any other thing. I can only do it through love. So when he got the chance to write the gospel, he's like the one whom he loved the most. He starts it. And even look at him, how he depicts Jesus. He, all the other gospels, John talks about uh, Jesus' birth and things like that. But he never talks about it. He talks about in the beginning there is word. He goes to the beginning. Not to the earthly inception, but the beginning. There was nothing that was created without him. You know, everybody was talking about his earthly beginning, and he goes to the beginning of the beginning. How, who, how was he able to go beyond this? He was able to understand the difference between the limitations of the flesh versus spirit. He was able to travel beyond things and be able to go beyond uh, uh, just what he can see from the natural eye. That's why if you see uh, the, the gospel according to St. John, you will have different uh, uh, stories in there, different incidents in there than the other three gospels. What theologians call them as the synoptical gospels, all three of them, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John doesn't fall into that category because he found his niche by being close to Jesus. He wasn't just going to travel with, with Jesus, but he just wanted to fall on him. He just wanted Jesus to lay on him. He just wants him to be all with him wherever he went. Can I say that's John's character? He wanted, he is somebody who craved for intimate position with Jesus. He was desiring that intimate position with Jesus. So somebody who desires intimate position, they, they are always welcome to inside. You know, when they are even presenting things, he'll be like, are you done? You know, sometimes you just like, okay, you, when, when, <laughs> when uh, there are three kids in the family and uh, uh, one of the kids is uh, not understanding the father properly and somebody has a deep relationship with the father. And that person comes out and says, what, what, what are you talking about? He's not like that. Don't you get it? He, they, they try to explain it because they had an intimate relationship with the father. Unfortunately, this is another thing. Unfortunately, the wife, uh, when the wife doesn't have intimate relationship with the husband, then the wife is never able to translate the, the intentions of the father to the children. That's why the gap is created. So the, the, as much as the daddy's responsibility is to connect, the father's responsibility to connect with the, uh, with the children, so much as is the mother's responsibility to get them connected. Are you with me here? The same thing is true when it comes to the gospel being preached. Us as the church, we have the responsibility for the world to have a better depiction of the Father. Because when they go to the Father, they don't have that intimate relationship. And all they have is a distorted image. And the ones that have an intimate access is not revealing his personality. Or the ones that have the intimate access is not trying enough to learn him or to know him, Bible says. Bible talks about knowing. Knowing is intimacy, right? It's about intimacy, getting into the depths of it, into the details of it, knowing the things that nobody else knows. What we can call is, in the, in the, in the Bible, we call it as revelation. Remember, Jesus talks to Peter, flesh and blood did not reveal that to you, but my Father in heaven has revealed that to you. 
because of that intimacy. So here they are, they are doing that and Jesus gives that distinction. One of the characters I like to present here is the 24th uh, verse. This has got nothing to do with John, but I believe it is important. When the ten, ten heard it, they were greatly displeased with the two brothers. Now look, the camps are dividing. The camps are dividing. Now the leader's job, John, the Jesus, did not let it go by. He summons them all. Come to me, all of them. He brings them all. But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And those, those who are great exercise authority, uh, uh, great exercise and authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. He gives us what is a true authority in, the, in his kingdom. He explains to them so that they won't, they won't stay in the division. It's important as parents we have to learn that. It's important as leaders we have to learn that. You know, the only reason that Jesus was able to explain, he never said, John and James were wrong, you guys are right. He wasn't taking sides, rather, he was presenting them both the same thing, the truth that sets them free. <clears throat> He presents that this is one of the one of the amazing mastery master characters I really love to to desire in my life. Then you can resolve conflict. Isn't that amazing? It's hard to resolve conflict, especially when two of them have two polar views. There, Jesus sitting there, come to me. That is. That is the power and the beauty of discipleship. When somebody is disciple, they will be willing to hear. That's why it is important how good is my hearing, how much of a disciple you are. If you don't become a good disciple, you cannot hear. You cannot get the instructions. You always have a chip on your shoulder. And then he was able to summon them in and he taught them and straight, straightened them. Yet it shall not be so among you, 26 tours. But whoever, he, now he gives a blank check again. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. What an amazing call. He's giving us an opportunity to become great. But it is not going to happen with our flesh, but by crucifying our flesh. <clears throat> Only through crucifying our flesh. We cannot do it straight with our own strength. Because to serve others is not easy. Amen? Amen. Especially somebody you don't like. <laughs> <laughs> this is all you get, man. You know, whenever you're, you're in the restaurant, they'll say the saying, don't, 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 don't get the chef mad. You don't know what you're getting in your plate. <laughs> right? <laughs> but remember, they are there to serve. You know, in all my life when I worked in food industry, I had, I got mad at people that were really unreasonable, but never, ever once tried to do wrong by them. Because I have joined that place to serve. Customer service. If you don't want people's uh, nonsense, don't get into customer service. Is that a good piece of advice? Amen. <laughs> you know, especially in food industry, people, when they come for food, guess what? They are hungry. Their, their tolerance levels are not that good. You can argue with them as much as they want. They're nicest people probably after they eat their lunch. But when they want their lunch, you best give them what they ask for. And in that service mindset, when we miss that service mindset that we are there to serve. And believe it or not, this protocol that Jesus has set here has helped me to build my life. Even as my uh, I, 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 I work, no matter where I worked, 
This has become my motto. I'm here to serve. You know, yeah, there are bad calls that come, people that annoy you, and all those kinds of things will happen. But at the end of the day, I'm getting paid to serve. Right? We are in the service industry. No matter where you go, you have to serve somebody. It doesn't matter where you go. Even if you own your own business, you still got to serve somebody. So may as well get used to it. How we can give excellent service. How can you become great? By serving the best. Amen. How can I serve the best? Don't look for how can I become great. Look at how can I serve the best. Yeah. When we can put our focus on serving the best, your greatness is automatically there. In an industry that I have no educational experience, no background, nothing else, I was given some greatest accomplishments in there. In the industry that I have worked. Greatest things I was able to achieve in there. Not because I am smart. Not because I was able to do this or that. But because I was able to serve. Amen. Amen. And more than anything, in the kingdom of God, in the body of Christ, the most important position you and me can assume is how to serve. Not to be served. Instead, how can I serve? The mindset has to be there. That should be the first part. How can I serve you? You know, believe it or not, by now you shouldn't have an understanding about this thing. For this covenant fusion church, our main motto is not about what you can give me. It's about what I can give you. What I can be for you. How can I be a blessing into your life? Not about, oh, are you paying my tithes? Are you giving this? Are you doing that? That's not my job. That is yours and your God's. Ultimately, you are responsible to God. If you don't serve, if God has called you to uh, serve in this place and you are not serving, that's between you and your God. But if I don't serve you, that's between me and my God. Amen. So I'm responsible for my servitude to you. Not the other way around. Yeah. Unfortunately, a lot of the churches are turning upside down. They want people to serve them. They want people to call them with great honors and great this and great that. And they miss out on the greatest opportunity that Jesus has ever given. You can become great by serving. Not by demanding. And the same formula applies even for marriages. What did you do to me? What did you not do to me? That's not the place. We, we look at how can I serve my husband? How can I serve my wife? Even though I grew up in a culture where it is a, a male dominant culture. Even though I grew up with that, my culture is now changed and is changing continually to be a biblical culture. Amen. And because of the biblical culture, I honor my wife. I serve her. I don't demand her. I serve her. Guess what? She serves me too. Amen. We both are servants unto each other. We never feel like, oh, you're the husband or you're the wife. We don't see that. Mm -hmm. Those roles doesn't really exist in our life. Because we choose to serve each other. The same model I love to depict even in the church, even in my ministry. Everywhere I go, I just want to see how can I serve you? How can I serve others? Is there an opportunity where I can be a blessing into your life? Mm -hmm. That's what I look at. I like to listen to people when they talk. When they see, is there something there that I can be a blessing? Amen. If that's not the case, I think I should drop from my calling. Don't you agree, Johnny? If I'm not looking to serve others. To serve his people. I should not pursue my calling. Because calling and character are not two different things. If you don't have character, your calling can become a mess. 
That's what we saw many times. We see it time and time again. The people that have done great ministry, but their character is so flawed. <clears throat> and because of that, their calling has become ineffective. I'd rather work on my character than on my calling. Can somebody say amen to that? Amen. Because what I do in front of you, I should be able to do it even behind you. Let me be very honest, if I don't like something, I can tell you to your face. Yeah. <laughs> and I hate it so much if someone has to second guess me when I say I love you. But we do, isn't it? <clears throat> but we do that because we, we have lived through so much of deception. Yeah. People that have said something and never meant it. Sure. People said that they would be there for us and never been there for us. We have gone through all those things. That's why our, our expectations are so shattered. But every day I try to build myself so much, especially with my marriage in the beginning, with my wife. I have to explain to her so much. I will never lie about your cooking. She would come and ask me, how about this? You know, in the beginning, I almost said it, it, it tastes like garbage, but I'm like, okay, no, I can't say that. <laughs> you know, God had mercy on me. I didn't say that. Probably she would have walked off on me. But anyway, <laughs> uh, I didn't say that. But nevertheless, I told her I didn't like this. She would take offense about it in the beginning. I had to tell her, just because I don't like something that you cook, doesn't mean I don't like you. Amen. <laughs> You're still my number one. But that curry, that food, don't cook it again, please. <laughs> For the love of God, don't do that. <laughs> <You know? laughs> let's, not, let's not get into that chamber anymore. Let's, let's move away from it. But if I don't give her that honest response to her, when the day she is crying, when I am crying with her, she should be able to trust me that I really am in vain with her. When I say, I have your back, she should be able to trust me that I have her back. Amen. That's upon me. I have to build that character. I have to show her, hey, as much as I am telling you this, this is the same thing. I am truthful to you. But whomever, for whomever I'm going after this, even though this is not a planned one. But any position, any place that God gives us, it's an opportunity to serve. How can we serve? Because he says, whoever desires to be the first among you, let him be your slave. Yeah. What a bad word these days. <laughs> you know, if Jesus was living this day, he'd probably be in prison just for saying that. But he is giving us an, a, 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 an impression that be in a place where you don't have a choice. A slave doesn't have a choice, right? Right. You know, we have seen that in the history. Most barbaric thing that has happened when men are enslaving others. And they don't have the freedom. They don't even have the freedom to eat. They don't have the freedom to do what they want. They don't have the freedom to talk. They don't have the freedom to walk. Imagine that. But in a similar context that Jesus was saying, when you come here, you don't have options. Come to that place. Accept serving him. Remember, serving him is the true freedom. Amen? Amen. Yeah. So, um, whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of God did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom to many. Do you think these words have influence on John? When he is writing this. If that was not the influence into his life. You wouldn't have the book of Revelation. He was willing to lay down his life. As a ransom for the book of Revelation. Think about that. He was willing there. You know the, uh, the early Christians. Are willing to lay down their life. <clears throat> they thought. Okay I can pay this as a ransom. Because they are seeing us in their death. 
Someone down there is going to appreciate this. That's why it is important. Don't just deal with this thing as a book. There is a lot of blood that has to be shed for this book to be available in our hands. For us, we don't even have the time to flip a page here when they have shed their blood. <clears throat> right? So that's one thing. This gives us an insight into the character of, 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 of uh, John. But now I'm going after the group that, that uh, this letter is being written to. I'm going to break it down more next week also, next time also. But this is more of, of uh, introduction here. I just want to lay the foundation. We know John's character. He's someone who wanted to be intimate with, with Jesus. He wanted to get into the depths with Jesus. He wanted to live where Jesus is. He never wanted to be separated from Jesus. He was able to hold on to it as long as he could with his physical strength. But bless God, once the Holy Spirit have come, look, the two opposing forces, John and Peter, they're standing here. They're standing in front of this guy and says, gold and silver I have not in the name of Jesus. That's the biggest reconciliation, I believe. The two forces coming together into one camp. The unity, the diversity have now become the unity. In that unity, they saw the power of God, boom, go through them. Amen? Amen. You and me might be diverse, that's absolutely fine. But let's form a unity through that. That's going to change the scope. This letter is being written to... Uh, a group of believers, most possibly, the group is in uh, what, the, what we call in the modern day Turkey. You know, Turkey is part Europe and part Asia. It's just, it's just in that borderline. So they call it even as Asia then during that, those days. And that, well, historians believe that is what, that is where he, he, he is preaching. He is writing this letter to. But mainly, this letter he is writing to believers. Can somebody say believers? Believers. Because this is not being written to stray people, but to the believers. You know, this is another problem with Christians. We try to imply the believers' rules to the Gentiles. It doesn't work like that. They don't have the capacity to do that. Are you able to walk in righteousness when you were a sinner? Think about that. Then why are we trying to impose it on them? The only thing that we can cry out for them is for salvation. The people that doesn't know God, that is how, what they do. They do lawless things. They do barbaric things. They do things uh, that normalize sin. And that is where we have to understand we don't fight with flesh and blood. They are being influenced by these principalities right now. One of the things that we are standing with choices is for life because the group other side is trying to kill life. They take, steal, kill, and destroy. Whose plan is that? The devil's, right? Is the devil's plan. He always wants to steal, kill, and destroy. Whereas Jesus said, I have come that you might have and enjoy life to the full till it overflows. And that's where we are going. That is why we are standing for life. Amen? Mm -hmm. So in here, I don't hate people like, like uh, uh, Liz was sharing uh, uh, a testimony today. Like, I, I, I just lent her a ear. I gave her the tissues. I was just standing with her. <coughs> I didn't condemn her. Why were you in this awful state? Why were you this? What, don't you know that God doesn't like this thing? God doesn't want you to do this thing, that thing? No, no, none of those things really matter to them. But the, the true deliverance came through love. Amen. Amen? The bridge between the sinner and the righteous, the sinner and the righteous is love. We remember God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Right, what was he doing? He is bridging between sinner and himself through love. But what is he doing? The bridge that he is laying down is Jesus Christ. But he has to go through love. Right? 
Now, if that's the case for us to come to him, how do you expect the other people to come to the Lord without love? It has to be through love, amen? Yeah. But here, he is writing this letter to believers, the group of people that are there in the first century. This is, this is all happening in the first century. Why I make this an important deal is because in the, what is happening in the first century in that region, if you understand it, we will be able to understand how to deal with it. Why is he coming at this angle? <clears throat> Why is he talking about this thing? What is prominent during this era of the people that are following this thing, a lot of the Christians were also following this mindset, this teaching. They were following this teaching, what is called Gnosticism. They were like uh, Gnostics. What are this? There, there is a thing that I wrote about. The Gnostics considered uh, the principal element of salvation to be Direct knowledge of the supreme divinity in the form of a mystical or esoteric insight. Uh, uh, many Gnostic texts deal not in concepts of sin and repentance, but with illusion and enlightenment. That's his target audience. Right now, this Gnosticism has been infiltrated into the church. That has become a common practice during that time. Okay, now why is it relevant these days? Look at this thing, what are they saying? They are considered, you know, for them, the, the concepts of sin and repentance are replaced with illusion and enlightenment. Okay, for them, there is no concept of sin. Their biggest belief is that uh, 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 the, the, the spirit in entirely is good and then the matter is entirely evil. So your body, your physical or the carnality is the evil and your spirit is good. Is that what the Bible teaches us? And in other, words, in other words, what they do also is they give up, they, they don't acknowledge or they don't need salvation. Why is it so important? Today, if you look at the society, most of the people are falling in this line. They acknowledge there is a supreme being. They acknowledge there is a God. But for them, sin is irrelevant. Okay, that's why the title I put in today is Self-Morality versus God-Morality. That is what this study is about. Self-Morality versus God-Morality. Do you think it's a relevant topic? Because we are living in a society now where... God morality is irrelevant. Self morality. Oh, everything. Oh, I'm doing good. You know, one day a person came to me and she 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 lost her dad, uh, and I was trying to uh, pray and I was trying to con uh, console her and comfort her and encourage her through the gospel and all those things. She comes to me saying, "I'm going, I'm I'm going through all these things." And uh, the statement she made it, I even, I even saved stray cats. How many more stray cats I have to save? I'm like, what kind of Bible are you reading? <laughs> she assumes she thinks by saving these stray cats, she's somehow going to go to heaven. Cats? Yes. Wow. Oh. Wow. Okay. And that's not far from you. Okay. They're all looking at their self morality. Right. right and wrong is not being taught these days in school. Amen. They're only saying it's relevant. It's only something what you think. There, is, there are no absolutes. You know, I really want to find that person who says there are no absolutes. I want to ask them is that an absolute that you exist? 
Is that not an absolute you exist? So for them, there are no absolutes. There is nothing absolute. They are like, okay, everything is everything. Everything can go. Whatever you say goes. <clears throat> you know, if you look at <laughs> one of the biggest models that has been propagated during the um, era where Be Beatles were so popular, what is, uh, uh, yeah, the rock and roll era and all those kinds of times, and like, uh, live and let live. You know, that has been a big model. What happened there? They became a licentious life. There was no moral boundaries. Whatever rocks you work, go do it. And this all comes from Gnosticism. They all have, they acknowledge there is a supreme being, but they don't acknowledge that there is an absolute truth. That there is an absolute sin and righteousness. There is an absolute need of a salvation and a savior. Amen. There is no such acknowledgement. And in here also they are actually they are infiltrated into Christians. They were infiltrated into Christianity during that era. And now John is taking a jab at them let's say. John is giving them hey I'm coming to you to explain where you are going. So I believe the purpose of this uh, first John is simply this. Exposing false teachers and to give believer assurance of salvation. Those are the two main things that John is after when he was writing this letter. He's trying to expose the, expose the fa false teachers. And the second, to give believers an assurance of salvation. What happens when false teaching comes? Your salvation is in shadows. What, I, what am I believing all my life? I thought Jesus is the only way. Look at these people. Everybody is doing this and that and that and this. And it is acceptable in the church these days. Sin is no longer sin. Even in church. Come on somebody. You know, in church, we are changing rules. Yeah. In church, for crying out loud. In the world, that's a different story. <coughs> yeah. In the church, we are changing the rules. Sin is no longer sin. We are appropriating sin as if you and me created sin. As if you and me set the standards. Because we are no longer looking at God's morality, but self-morality. And I believe this should prepare us, also educate us enough to understand what is happening around us so we may respond rightly. Can I say this thing? There is nothing new under the sun. Amen. <laughs> the church had to face this thing when? In the beginning. In the first century, if it faced then, why are we worried about it now? It survived, in it? It's been 2,000 years, more than 2,000 years since it has happened. Still the gospel is alive, amen? Amen. Because we held on to the truth. Because the pulpits preach the truth and we need to continue to preach the truth. Amen. amen. And as long as we are preaching the truth, whether you like it or not, that's not the criteria here. We are never, as long as we are preaching the truth and as long as we are pursuing to follow the truth, Glory be to God, we still have a chance. Amen. A befitting chance, I thought. So come with me for this journey whenever I'm going to start. The first John, we will start the study about the difference between the self-morality versus God morality. You got something out of this? Yes. Amen. I know I dragged it a little bit, but... Introduction, I just want to give a good introduction so we have a good foundation before we go into the next level. Okay. So I encourage you to read the verse John and uh, have any questions that you might have, prepare yourself. You know, the Bible study becomes more interesting when I have questions. Like I said, my wife makes me a good Bible student because she always comes with questions. And I enjoy them. So I encourage you, come up with any questions you like.
We will have a discussion. We will have a, a growth of knowledge. Amen? Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless us with, the, with this knowledge so we may grow and be the best for Him. Amen? Amen. Your will be done. In my life as it is in heaven. I'm going to say this two, uh, two ways, right? Your will be done in my life as it is in heaven. Your will be done in my family as it is in heaven. Your will be done in my nation as it is in heaven. Can we do that? Yes. Uh, before we do that, that would be our ending. But before we do that, I love for us to pray for India. Right now, their cases are getting so high with this COVID. Yes. And people are dying by the thousands every day. For the lack of oxygen. For whatever reason. But I want to, I want us to, I want, I know very well that for our God nothing is impossible. Amen. So we can come in agreement. If you don't mind standing to your feet, we all can come in agreement. If you want to uh, touch and hold someone, uh, your neighbor, you please do so if you feel comfortable enough. Um, hold your neighbor's hand and come in agreement. So we may all come, come here. Let's, let's, we can stand, you can stand here. Anybody that can, that you can stand with, just stand in agreement so we may all release the healing power of Jesus over that land. Amen? Amen. Lord Jesus, we cry upon, cry unto you, Lord, for the nation India right now, Father. Lord, from, the, uh, from Kashmir to Kanyakumari, from the north to the south, from the east to the west, in the name of Jesus. We release your blood healing right now in Jesus' name. By your stripes, we walk healed. We take charge over that nation. We come against the plague in the name of Jesus. We stand against this, uh, this insurgence, Father, in the name of Jesus. We rebuke you. We speak death to you in Jesus' name. Oh, we bind all the principalities, the powers that are trying to uh, process this, Father, that are trying to spread this. In the name of Jesus, we bind them all. And we speak healing. No more death. We stand against the death angel with the blood of Jesus, the Passover blood of the Lamb. And we speak healing. India, be healed in Jesus' name. Right now, right now in Jesus' name, we come against all those principalities, all that sickness right now, Father. We take charge over that land. We take charge over that land in the name of Jesus. Have your way. Have your way. Have your way upon that land, Father. Heal the sick right now. No matter where they are, people are desperate, Lord, right now. In their desperate minds, send forth a peace spirit, Father, that they may reach out to that spirit of peace and, and have the comfort and confidence that this too shall pass. Amen. Oh, we bless you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. We come in agreement with our brothers and sisters who are crying out to you in that land, Father. We come in agreement that your healing power will invade the cities, the villages, the highways, the byways, the hospitals, the doctors, the nurses, the equipment, the lack of oxygen. There shall be abundance in the name of Jesus. Oh, thank you, Lord. Breathe. Holy Spirit, breathe over that land right now. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Release the Holy Spirit right now. If you are blessed to praying in tongues, go on, pray on. Release him. Release him upon that land in the name of Jesus. Yes, oh God, we bless that land. We bless that land. Curse, you have to leave. Sickness, you have to leave. COVID-19, you have to leave. The freedom of truth shall prevail. The freedom of truth shall prevail. Where the leaders are feeling helpless, Father, the help is on the way. Jesus, the helper. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Have your way. In Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. And the church said, Amen. And the church said, Amen. Your will be done in my life as it is in heaven. Your will be done in my family as it is in heaven. Your will be done in my land as it is in 
heaven in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are out.